Hey, but you've got this. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Oh, it looks you. like we're live. Hi, YouTube. Yeah. Um, so it's setting up right now. I will turn my camera off so that you have all the, so that your face is the only one showing. Uh, I think you can go ahead. Oh, wait, no, we're starting at 12, so we still have some time. Do you know the link for this video on YouTube, just so I can interact with chat? Yeah, um, I will send it in the Zoom chat. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. also have an anonymous Google form set up uh, for your Q&A section. Oh, cool. Yeah, whichever way works best. <laughs>
Um, looks like Anjali is here, so I think we're ready to get started. Uh, you can a quick intro, fine. Yeah, already. Uh, sorry, Sadia, what do you say? We can get started now. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, awesome. So I guess we could just start with introductions. Um, Professor Wade, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. I am Wade Fagan-Omsteiner. I am a professor of computer science teaching here at the University of Illinois and excited to get to chat with you guys. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, my name is Anjali. I'm one of the sales staff members. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, feel free to get started with your presentation. Um, I'll just be on mute. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to... Um... I will go ahead and share my screen and I've got a few slides for us today. So I am super hyped to be able to give this talk because um, I heard that you guys are all going to be considering or coming to the University of Illinois, which is fantastic. Um, so I want to, I feel like no good party starts without introductions. So um, we've already, I've introduced myself a little bit. So I'm Wade Fagan-Olmsteiner. I'm a teaching associate professor in the Department of Computer Science here. And I want to learn about you guys. So I want to um, try out this um, kind of having this talk being a, a little interactive. So um, I first want to just see kind of how long the delay is between what I'm seeing in the YouTube chat over here and this presentation. So can you just tell me hello in the, um, so I just said hello here. Um, definitely say hello to me in the YouTube chat um, just so that I know you're here, that we're here together and that we can do some interactive stuff together. So if you wouldn't mind just saying hello in chat, that'd be fantastic. And in addition to that, I want to have us not just kind of make this a very static presentation, because I'm going to share kind of what you'll get to experience when you're here at Illinois. And, um, but I want to also build something together with you. So part of this experience is I need your help to build this thing with me. So we're gonna go through one of the things that you'll be building in um, probably your sophomore year. And we won't go through the technical details. Um, there's a lot of algorithms that we're gonna skip over, but I want to show you some uh, assignment that I worked with um, stu students just like you to develop. And um, I need your help for this. So what I need is I'm gonna send a um, form in the chat and this link is to a Google form, which I want you to pick an image of something meaningful to you. It might be your profile picture. It might be a picture of your um, cat or your dog, whatever it is. And send that, and, and it's an image that you're okay um, ha having seen here on the YouTube video. And send that video, um, fill out that form to send that picture to us. And we're going to use that picture as an input to an algorithm in um, about 20 or 30 minutes. So what? Um, so if you can fill out that form, it's a two question form, just who you are and having you submit an image. So um, definitely fill out that form and we'll get those images and I'll do something with that image in a second. And in addition to that, I also need one other bit of information from you. So as you're filling out the form, um, and I'm just going to verify that this form is looking good. So um, hopefully you're able to fill out that form, but I also need one other piece of information for you for what we're going to build in, at the end of this session. So I need to know what of these three images. So in chat, can you give me an either a one, a two, or a three based on what you best identify with Illinois? So number one is the beautiful Fullinger Auditorium. I overheard the last session when you were talking about advisors about talking about CS125, which is your intro programming course. 
And that course is held in the beautiful Follinger. So that's an image number one. It's at the south side of the main quad. If you haven't been on campus, it's just this absolutely gorgeous building. And in fact, in image number two, you can see Follinger out in the distance. So this is a shot that was, um, so number two was taken on top of the student union. So this is what we consider central campus in image number two. And you're looking down across the beautiful quad and every day you'll see just tons of people hanging out there. And it's been a great spot to sort of meet up with a close group of friends with um, even during COVID with masks and all that kind of stuff with a lot of outdoor activities. So that's been really fun. And then the number three image is the alma mater. So um, the alma mater is this absolutely gorgeous statue that sits at kind of the center point of campus that really kind of welcomes you to the University of Illinois. So in chat, put one, two, or three for your favorite image that we're gonna to use to create um, this mosaic together. So Awesome, thank you. So thank you for sharing that. So definitely put in chat and we'll come back to that in a bit. But what I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you a little about the University of Illinois. So you are going to be joining this absolutely amazing program where what you'll see is this will go so far beyond kind of any experience you've had so far, because what you, who you'll be working with and the people you'll be surrounded with every single day are just fantastic, amazing people. So just to kind of highlight a few faculty members. Um, so we have the president of the IEEE organization. So IEEE is the um, uh, premier engineering society that, um, or Electrical Engineering Society, and Bill, somebody who I know personally, and I've had many conversations with him, and he teaches classes here at Illinois. He's the president of that society. We've got a number of members of the National Academies, such as Sarita, whose picture I have here. Um, so Sami is one of the, our, one, a phenomenal AI researcher um, in the top right, and he's um, got the Sloan Research Fellowship, which is one of the most prestigious fellowships and one of the biggest kind of research agencies on, in the US government is known as the National Science Foundation. And one of the top awards you can get there is something called the Career Award. And every single semester we have faculty um, winning the Career Awards. So um, these are all, so all of these faculty are people who teach classes and who you will see as you um, journey through your career at Illinois. So in addition to just working with amazing faculty, you also will be surrounded by students who are doing amazing things and you will be a part of this group. So just looking at a few students who I know, who I've worked with personally in research and um, is like on the top left, it's Natalia and Matt who um, presented at both ASEE. So this is a top conference in um, engineering education. This is the American Society of Engineering Education. They presented last year at that conference right before COVID. This is kind of an eerie picture because it was taken, I think like at the beginning of March, right before the shutdowns happened. So it's kind of weird to see this picture. Um, and then we have something called the Knights of St. Patrick, which is this um, prestigious campus organization that highlights the very top seniors. And um, Karen is somebody who I've worked with on research. She's done a research project under me and she um, graduated last year, but graduated as a Knight of St. Patrick. And we also have phenomenal people doing cutting edge research on things like virtual reality. So you are working, you're going to be surrounded by amazing students and amazing opportunities at Illinois. And the way you get to these amazing opportunities is, and the way you interact with amazing faculty is often both being social in kind of computer science and around campus, um, but also through your courses. So one thing that I think you guys have talked about in the advising panel, so I'm not gonna spend much time here, is you've got this, uh, this really strong set of core courses. And what I really love about Illinois, and you'll see that this is different than a lot of programs, is our core is very small. That effectively, depending on what flavor of plus X you might be, um, you might have to choose one or the, one side or the other side of the or in the middle of it. But basically we have just, I kind of think of it as four levels of courses that you get through. Um, and I kind of lay these out as kind of the very top, your CS 125 slash 124, 128. That's really your freshman year. And then as you kind of move to a later part of your freshman year, second semester, freshman year, or possibly first semester, sophomore year, you take CS 173 and 225. These are your foundational discrete math course and your foundational data structures course. 
In the second half of your sophomore year or possibly your junior year, you may end up in CS 233 and 241 or the course that I'm currently teaching, which is CS 240, which is a um, computer systems course that really lets you nerd out on how do you build microservices and how do you make an app that you can scale to millions of users. And then the final set of courses you take, usually at the beginning of your junior year, is um, a numerical methods course, a probability statistics course, and an algorithms course. And the beauty is once you finish this course, so this is all of the core courses that you're really going to take, everything else is an advanced 400 level course that you go deep in a particular subject area and you work with some of the best researchers in that space. So this is um, just a phenomenal set of kind of core courses that's really, really small so that you can focus on working with amazing faculty doing advanced work as early as possible. And it's not uncommon to hear sophomores and juniors taking some 400 level courses and being able to take four or five 400 level courses in their senior year. So this is just a little bit of an overflow overview of the course structure itself. But I um, could, I have felt like the best value I can add to you is to talk about one of the courses that I teach and take you for just maybe 10 minutes into an Illinois classroom. So, um, so as into an Illinois classroom, we have one of the classes that I teach is a course on data visualization. And what, if you talk to most students and they say, hey, do you know who Professor Wade is? They'll say, oh yeah, he made the GPA visualization and or he said, they'll say he made the corona visualization that a bunch of governors used. So depending on kind of what work of them, what work that they know that I've done, they really know that I'm the person who does a lot of really data forward data visualizations. So, and I, what I wanna say is that data science and data visualization is an amazing field. And a lot of people think it's really scary about math, but what I really emphasize in my class and to kind of to take you into like the first day of when you're in my data visualization class, is that really data science and data visualization is only as amazing as the story it tells. You can be the best programmer in the world, but if you can't tell the story about your results, that is going to be, um, that, that um, if you can't tell the story about your results, you're not going to be able to um, have other people understand what you have done. So when we talk about results, I have this something, something that I call the data, um, the data visualization quadrant. So this is a key idea that you will learn the first day of my class. And we go into a lot more depth in my class itself, but to give you a high level 10 minute view of this, the first side of the quadrant or the top half of the quadrant is going to be the two categories of data. Every number that you ever generate in any program or any data set you look at, I can place within two categories. The first category is it might be quant data. This is data with exact numbers. So we inside of the quant data, we can talk about the data being continuous. So your income, how much money you've made, it can be one cent higher, one cent lower. Your GPA, I know all of you guys are gonna have a 4.0, but you might have a 3.99 or a 3.98. So those um, GPAs, it's continuous, you can go up or down, or it can be discrete. So the number of people in this video, right now, in this video call right now is a discrete number. We can only have one higher or one lower. And then there's the number of days since January 1st. So we can say that here on, in the beginning of April, we are about 90 some odd days since January 1st. That's a discrete number. And we can identify every piece of data as either being quant data or categorical data. And categorical data is gonna be any data that has buckets that can be bucketed. So this might be nominal data. So this is data that doesn't have a natural ordering. So something like a gender, something like the state that you were born in, so if you were born in um, Texas or California or New York or Illinois, that there is no ordering between those states. And the other type of categorical data is ordered data. So what we do is we identify every single piece of data that we create through our artificial intelligence programs or any other um, technique. And it looks like we might be missing the link. So I'm gonna... Um, so I'm gonna finish this quadrant thing and then we'll get that link sorted out. So thank you guys. Um, so so the, between the quadrant, between the top half of the quadrant, the quant data and the categorical data, we have two pieces, uh, the other two pieces of the quadrant is how do we encode this data visually? 
So if I have quant data, I'm going to go down in my quadrant and I'm going to say that planar encoding works really great for quant data. That we see that when we have data that um, we want to position on a graph by the x, y coordinate. So where is it physically located on the screen? We're going to often look for our quantit quantitative data and say, hey, our quant data is going to be great for um, planar encoding. On the other hand, categorical data is great for retinal encoding. Retinal encoding is what your eyes see. So I think all of you guys understand the x, y coordinates of things. But let's talk about retinal encoding. How is retinal and how does retinal encoding work? But before that, let me go back to link to get you um, the link to the image. So I'm going to head back here and make sure to get you this link. It looks like I wasn't a host in the YouTube chat, so the link got moderated. So I'm going to go ahead and get this link to you guys. So I'm sending links to the hosts and they're gonna be able to do their magic. So thank you guys. Awesome, so if you can um, give an image so that we can use, um, we can play around with that image in a bit. So sorry about the technical difficulties. I think that's one of the downsides. So if you're normally in the room, um, when I give this talk in person, I have a QR code that you could scan. And I thought a link would be easier, but I should have done a QR code. So apologies for that. Oh, it says you need permission. Ah, we are. I'm fixing the permissions real fast to make sure. Okay, we let us, so now I think we're 100% good to go. Um, welcome to doing things live. You know that the curse of computer science is you'd never do things live because crazy things happen. Um, but if you, I'm just refreshing the page right now and I, in, an, in my other computer that's not logged into anything, I see that I can access the page. So you should be good to go. Thank you guys so much for letting me know about that. Sorry about that. Um, fix now. Awesome. I see you guys in chat that we are working. We are good to go. So to catch you guys up, to get us back on the same brainwaves, we've got four things that we care about. We care about what the type of the data is and whether or not it's quant or categorical and the type of encoding, whether or not it's planar or retinal encoding. So what I want to do is I want to explain the six different types of retinal encoding for you. And then we've got some interactive examples that I want to go through with you. So one type of retinal encoding is the size. So when you think about any data visualization, the size that something is conveys information to your eyes. So you, as somebody who does data visualization, you're going to want to care about what size is the thing that you're putting onto your screen. The second bit is you may care, you may want to use color saturation. So all five of these blocks are the exact same color blue, but these blocks have a different saturation of blue. They have a different intensity of that color of blue. And that's our second form of retinal encoding. The third, third form of retinal encoding is the orientation. So this is the exact same arrow. This arrow is simply rotated different directions so that I can show a different orientation of data. And if you think of like, anytime you have like stock market data or price data, you're gonna see like up and down arrows being a huge retinal encoding um, attribute where you may have the up arrow and you may also use the hue of that up arrow, which is our fourth form of retinal encoding. So a green up arrow may mean that um, something is worth more or, or red down arrow might be something is worth less. So these have the exact same color saturation. They have the same intensity of the color, but they have a different hue. The fifth is shape. So you can have your eyes are gonna be able to perceive a different type of data based on the shape of that data. So you can think about scatter plots. You're often seeing this type of retinal encoding. Um, and the last thing is, and this is the hardest one to use is texture as a form of retinal encoding. So all of these square blocks are the same size, the same color, the same saturation hue and the same orientation, but we have now added texture to these blocks. So this is one that I find that even in my own work, it's very, very hard to incorporate texture. And we can map that 
different types of retinal encoding, which we know that all retinal encoding works really well for categorical data. If the data is ordered, it's particularly great to have different sizes, different orientations, and different saturations. While if the data, data is nominal, it is going to be um, a different size of, um, or it's going to have a different color, a different shape, or a different texture. Now I want to do something really fun. So I want to do what I'm going to call is a one second challenge. And um, this is going to, um, I'm going to show you an image and I'm going to just leave it up for a fraction of a second. And I want you to see if you can see something in this image. And when you do, I want to know what you saw. So write in chat, when you see something in this image, what do you see in this image? So I'm going to show it to you for just a second. And then tell me in chat what you saw. So let me know what you saw in the image in chat. And there's a little bit of a delay. So it will be um, just a second as I watch for your response. And what I'm guessing that many of you saw is that you saw a, um, awesome, you saw a bunch of jagged lines is something I'm seeing. The very first person saw jagged lines. You saw a line graph, shows kind of um, one thing that a lot of people mention is a red line at the top, awesome. And in that red line at the top, we have, um, so you really kind of, your eyes drew to that red line and other people said there's gray lines beneath that. And um, that there's something bold at the top. So without even thinking about the image, you were actually able to identify different parts of this image without really understanding what this image even is. So we call, so this is actually an award-winning visualization that Bloomberg News put out um, about five years ago, that this is a visualization that showed the global climate temperature of the planet mapped by every single month. And so you've got the average for January, February, all the way through December along the x-axis. And then the y-axis is the average, um, the deviation from the average temperature. And then they added a little bit of a, um, the, they increase the size, they increase the thickness of the line as the um, temperature goes up, as well as having more intensity, more of saturation of a red color. So you can see the very top is a very bold red, while as you go down, you have less saturation of that red color. So we were able to describe this visualization in very technical terms. But the most interesting thing is you were able to tell me a lot about this visualization by just seeing it for a fraction of a second. So this is something that we call pre-attentive features, that we can actually hack your mind to actually see things in data visualizations that you might not actually see, if, uh, that you might not realize that you actually see. So your, ba your brain is going to realize things that you actually haven't actually fully processed. So before you're paying attention to it, your brain is already seeing certain patterns. And we can actually discover what these patterns are. So I'm going to do just one more one second challenge. Um, and right there, I just showed you something. And I want to know, in that image that you didn't even know what to expect, did you see anything at all? So what did you see in that image? And what we're going to do by doing this is we're going to discover if you can realize what pre-attentive features are. So I think we just saw it. I think we've got that. It's about 30 seconds between. Awesome. So people are seeing a grid of red squares, or sorry, grid of squares with two red squares. And so what's really interesting is I'm hopeful that, oh, awesome. So Noah said that one is in the bottom right corner. And we might have, oh, Rohan is giving me the exact coordinates. This is amazing. So Rohan is saying that he was able to see in just a fraction of a second 
where each of the red blocks are. And in fact, um, I think all of you guys were able to see this, that we could give, you could almost give me the exact coordinate of where every single red block is without even really having to pay attention to this image. You didn't know this image was coming and you were able to identify this exact image. So this is a form of pre-attentive processing. So when you have an otherwise uniform field, so if there's nothing otherwise interesting in the field of vision, and there is a difference of color in particular spots of the image, the use of color is a way that we can hack your brain to actually give you information without actually you realizing that information is coming through your brain. So this, so color is a form of pre-attentive processing. We can go through a number of different pre-attentive processing. So um, I encourage you guys to sort of, I'm gonna show you these things for just a fraction of a second, but then I'm not gonna to wait to sort of have you guys react to them. But I do want you to um, do this yourself is as you're seeing these things, see the, if you can see, um, if you can remember what you just saw. So I'm gonna do this for our second form of pre-attentive processing. And I speculate that all of you were able to identify that there was a circle among this field. And in this circle, you saw the circle was on the left-hand side of the graph, probably like the third column and the second row. And if that's what you saw, you're exactly right. That the form of an object is, the, is, a, for, is a type of a pre-attentive feature. So if in, in an otherwise uniform field, if something has a different form, your eyes are gonna be attracted to that particular form. The third type of pre-attentive processing, the third way we can hack your brain, and we actually see this online a ton, is movement. So movement in an otherwise static field, if you have something that's moving, something that's changing, that is a way that we can send information to your brain before you're actually even paying attention to this image. So if you've ever seen an ad that flashes different colors on the web, that is a form of color movement, that it's changing the color of the image and your eyes are drawn to that form of movement because of pre-attentive processing. It's how our brains are wired. And the fourth major category of pre-attentive processing is the spatial positioning. So spatial positioning is where in an otherwise uniform field, if you have something that is slightly offset from the underlying grid, that that form of spatial positioning is going to be um, something that is going to be recognized by your brain as a form of pre-attentive processing. So this is really cool. We have sort of learned how to hack your brain into seeing different bits of a data visualization. And I really want to have us put it together. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to share a image that is just like what we've seen before, where we have a number of squares. And I want you to count the number of red squares. And when you count the number of red squares, when you have the total number of red squares, put that number in chat. So I want to know how many red squares are on the next screen. As, as soon as you have that count, so get your chat ready, like get your cursor in chat. And I want to know, as soon as you have that count, write that number and press enter. I want to see how fast you guys are able to get this. So, and I will keep a time. I've got this stream over on my other computer. So I'll be able to know exactly when you guys see it. And I want to see how fast you are at putting this together. So are you ready? Let's do this. So what you'll see is this takes somewhere between five to 10 seconds, it looks like, for you to actually be able to spot all of the red squares, count all of the red squares, and then somehow figure out what the count is and then type into your computer. So there's a little bit more of a delay because you do have to type that into your computer, but you're going to um, hopefully find that, I see a few people got it wrong, but it's 16 total red squares. And it took you guys about, I would say seven seconds to see this. So I feel like that didn't work so well. I Let's see about another one. So I've got a second one and let's do this again. Now I'm gonna show a second image. And just like before, as soon as you count the number of red squares, put that number in chat. So three, two, one, let's go. Oh, 
Oh, okay. So you guys got 12 a lot faster. So what I'm guessing is happening is you guys are no longer counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on your screen. Instead, we used pre-attentive features to let you segment the image into different pieces. And my guess is that you actually took the um, four different quadrants and you said, okay, four times three is 12, 12, type it in chat, done. So we were able to use pre-attentive features to actually make the communication of data that you're being given on this visualization faster than the previous visualization, just by using some color and some spatial positioning and using it where you have an otherwise uniform field. So this is a really fun area that I think is an exciting area to research, an exciting area to think about how do we best convey information in especially technical information, especially like the results of artificial intelligence algorithms. How do we present this, out, this data to a broad community and how do we build algorithms to visualize things really, really well. So um, I so if you've been through my data visualization class, one of the fun things we get to do is we get to then create impactful data visualizations that we get to share with the world. So one Illinois data set that I've worked on is um, that I'm that most everyone on campus knows about was actually created with students who took this very course that I took these lecture slides from. And to give you a little back, bit, bit of background, the University of Illinois since at least 2012 publishes the statistical distribution of all of the course grades. They tell you how many A, B, C's, D's, and F's are in every single course that's taught at the University of Illinois. But they give it to you in this absolutely horrendous file. They give you an Excel file that was like created from a website. So if you open it up, it takes forever to load. Excel doesn't even think it's an Excel file. It freezes for several seconds every time you try and scroll it. It's just a hot mess. And what we did was we took this file and we said, okay, we're gonna clean it up, put it in a nice CSV format and then visualize it. And one thing that we talk about is when we do visualizations, we wanna portray motion. We wanna be able to tell a story with this visualization. So every um, visualization, we wanna think of why we make the choice to have different choices. So universally, there's only about three happy colors that no matter what culture you're from, no matter what your background is, generally you're gonna see the colors that appear in nature as happy colors. So these are colors like yellow, green, and blue. Those are gonna be colors that are universally seen as happy colors. Sad colors are actually quite a bit different. Different cultures have different sad colors. So some cultures see red as a sad color, while other cultures see red as a color, of proud, uh, uh, a color to be proud of. Um, so the really there's only one universally sad color and that's the color of basically a bruise. So a purpley color is a color that's pretty much universally seen as a color that portrays sad emotion. So what we did is we wanted to show the GPAs of every single course at Illinois through a series of colors that convey emotion. So a 4.0 GPA, GPA is a nice sunny day. We are happy, it is amazing. But by the time you get to a 2.0, oof, like that's, that's sad. So we want to think about what is the best way to share this visualization. And we're gonna use this color scheme and the larger the course, the bigger the circle. And if we go and look at this, this is some of the courses at Illinois. So um, I'm actually gonna have some of the, um, uh, because, um, yeah, I was going to kind of have this more interactive, but hey, we've got some of, um, Julie, can you help me out here? Yeah, for sure. What's up? Yeah. So um, math, did you take a math course that's like 221, 231, 241? Yeah, we had to. I did take it a while ago, but yeah. Yeah. So what was that course? Um, I took, I'm taking 415 right now. Oh. Um that's pretty bruised over here too. It's pretty bruised. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it just represents like a lot of students have to take it because it's part of the curriculum. But. Yeah. And particularly the two, the 220, 231, 241, those courses are your calculus courses, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the calc sequence here, it's rough. And what about physics? Did you take physics 211, 212, 213? Not yet, but from friends I've heard it's, it's not the most pleasant class. <laughs> so yeah. So one of the core courses you have to take is the physics courses. So like the advisor said, like it is tough. Like we expect a lot of you out of Illinois and these courses, like the part of the reason I have the GPA visualization is some of you may feel you've never gotten a B in your life. 
And like knowing that you're not alone, that the average GPA in these courses is a 2.3, that should help you put things in perspective. Um, and we can look at engineering. So engineering, we've got the CS courses. You can see um, the CS 241 is kind of notorious. You can see there's a little bruise spot right here in the 240 space in um, computer science. But you can see that as you get to the 400 levels, um, things get a little bit more sunny. But what's really funny is we can look at the differences between not just engineering and LAS courses, but we can also look at other courses. So look at business. Wow. Okay, so when you have a friend that's in the College of Business, it's a pretty sunny space down there. So you can't always compare GPAs is one thing that I really try and share with people is that there's gonna be different um, level, that different courses have different GPAs and different majors are gonna have different expectations for your GPAs. And we wanna really challenge you in computer science and you're gonna learn a ton. But to be fair to the College of Business, um, there are some of the majors that do have um, a little bit more bruising in their GPAs. Um, and we can look at uh, every one of these. One thing that I really want you to do is whenever you look at a visualization is be able to dive into the data, figure out what does this data mean? Why do we encode data as different points? So FIN 300, um, average GPA of 2.55. And, um, but there are majors like applied health sciences that are quite happy. And the reason I show this screen is to really contrast it with the next one, because wow, that's impactful. Like there's a story to be told about the difference between a really sunny area and a really bruised area. And we really can see the emotions on how this data is transferred. And hopefully you kind of see how this data um, makes a big difference. So this data visualization that was built by a bunch of students in me um, as part of my data visualization course, it's been viewed by basically the entire world. Um, if we just look at how, who is viewed in Illinois, obviously here, if you're in Champaign-Urbana, you care a lot about this. Um, but even as you see the Chicago area and the rest of the state of Illinois, basically what we have is a population distribution graph of Illinois based on the, who's viewed this data visualization. So that's really cool to be able to look at the analytics behind this kind of stuff. And I've done a number of other data visualizations. We can dive into a lot of the analytics, understand how people use it, um, look at different data sets and um, talk about other various GPAs. But um, I've done a bunch of different work on data visualizations. And um, I won't go through all of this. You can ch check out my website if you're interested in some of um, those data visualizations, but I hope to get to build a data visualization with you one day. But to finish up this talk, I want to look at the mosaics. So I know that because of the technical difficulties, we probably, I don't know if we were able to create your particular mosaic. Um, and so, I'm going to, one thing that I'm going to do is I think you guys have a Slack channel, right? That you guys are all part of. Is that right? Yeah, we have a Slack. Awesome. So I don't think we're going to have the, because of kind of the technical difficulties with the form and stuff, I don't think we have your mosaic. That was something that we were going to work on behind the scenes. Um, but I think I've got all the images. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the mosaic on your, on the Slack channel of your particular mosaic. But I want to go through this, um, mosaic with you because this section assignment that I created when I taught CS225 that I um, that I imagine you guys will be doing when you take data structures because it's such a fun way and it incorporates so many different concepts. So one thing is this is an image that was definitely taken a long time ago um, because this seems eerie nowadays, but we have a block eye on the football field made out of people posted on the Illinois Instagram and what I wanna do is I wanna be able to create a mosaic out of a number of different images. So what we can do is we can take an image like this and we can say, how can we make other images with this image? And I think I wanna kind of shrink this image and look at it further and further and further away. And what I see is if I look at this image really, really far away, I basically see a little bit of orange. And what you see is as you see an image from far and far further away, you are going to increasingly see um, just the average color of that image. So one thing that we can do is if we think about images of data, we can think about how is that, how is that data represented? So how is, uh, so we basically have a five dimensional vector of um, image data. We have an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, R coordinate, a G coordinate, and a B coordinate. And we find that even this five dimensional coordinate space isn't the greatest. So we actually, if you, in 
um, data structures, we actually represent the color as X, Y, and then an L coordinate, A coordinate, and a B coordinate. So we transform the color representation to a new color space. And we find the average color of every single image that we have on the Illinois Instagram. So here is a number of different images that we have on Illinois Instagram. And we see that there's the average color that's taken from looking at every single picture and every single image. And if I overlay the tiny image on top of the average color, it actually does a remarkably great job. So what you can see is you can see that we do a pretty good job. And what we want to do is we want to take an image such as maybe um, that we chose, for example, so this, you may have chosen the quad image. I'm going to check out what image you actually chose. And we're going to build that mosaic for you so that you can have this mosaic to take away from this talk. And as part of this image, we can divide it up into different segments and find for every single segment, what is the average color of that segment? And then replace the average color of that segment with an image and do that so we can replicate an image of Illinois made entirely with the pictures that you gave us. So unfortunately, I don't have that live reveal for you, but in Slack in about half an hour, I will definitely get that to you so you can see what the image of Illinois is made with all of us. And what's really cool is there's a lot of technical challenges in this. In addition to kind of mapping out how you build this grid and how you actually put everything together, you also need to map out how do you search your entire dictionary of images to find the image that has the closest matching color. And in fact, that search isn't trivial because you basically need to do a distance formula in three-dimensional space for every single image that's possible. And you need to do it really, really fast. So there's this actually really cool algorithm that you'll learn in data structures in your sophomore year, something called a KD tree. And a KD tree allows you to do a high dimensional search in logarithmic time. And this is super awesome because it makes an algorithm be able to accept thousands and thousands of tile images and still run in just a few seconds. So, um, and this is gonna improve significantly over doing the distance formula for every single possible region of this image against every other tile image. So these are kind of just some of the problems and some of the application of the problems that you're going to see before you even get to your upper level advanced classes. So it's really fun. Hopefully this gives you an idea of some of the exciting things and some of the creativity that comes with being a computer scientist and some of the fun problems that you get to work on here at Illinois. So um, I wanted to definitely say welcome to Illinois. It, hopefully this gave you a little bit of a taste of what an Illinois lecture is like, some of the problems that you get to solve in Illinois at Illinois, some of the things you'll learn and how data structures can be useful um, to building out problems that don't really seem naturally like, oh, hey, we have a whole bunch of data structures in a five dimensional search space problem. Interesting. So I think we've got a bit of time left for any questions. So I'm going to turn off my slides and have um, the staff here join me. And um, yeah, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think people really learned a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited that it was really interactive. Um, so we are going to post the form link in the chat. Uh, let's just wait a couple of moments, I guess, for questions to come in. Um, okay, there are some. Okay. Uh, what is the typical structure of a CS class in terms of when exams are administered, uh, the learning we do in lectures, and the learning we do outside of class, etc.? Yeah, so the CS classes are going to be, um, they're going to vary a lot by professor. So what you'll see is every professor has, uh, is going to teach the way that they teach best. So in my classes, for example, I give out these, um, so I'm so what you'll do is if you come into one of my classes, I think that one of the biggest things, if you write something, you'll learn something. So I'm here in my Siebel Center office. And like when you walk into my classroom, you will get a sheet of paper um, that's basically two-sided. And what we're going to go through is we're going to go through a bunch of problems that we've sort of outlined beforehand. So you, when you come into class, you're going to leave class with a whole bunch of new knowledge that you have these notes to sort of um, start to have a basis to begin to do um, the homework and the programming assignments. So you're often going to see that there's going to be um, a lecture component. And then from that lecture component, you're going to have to spend at least two or three times as much time as you spend in lecture going through either homework problems, going through programming problems, 
or other types of exercises to really reinforce the learning that you did, did in lecture. Yeah, that's really cool. I think it, there probably is going to be a difference between how it is isn't structured in COVID and non-COVID, but hopefully things will be back to normal. Um, the next question is, what is the scope of a CS undergrad student's experience in research? Yeah, so research, I think that's one of the best reasons to come to Illinois. And one of the reasons that I love being here is that I think the statistics is over half the undergraduates get involved with research with a professor before they graduate, which is phenomenal. I have, my research group is the G7 group. I usually work with about 20 to 25 undergraduates in an average semester. And um, they're working on projects that are like the GPA visualization that we described in the talk, that things that really convey information in new and interesting ways that get seen by lots of people that really make impact on the world and make the world a better place. So I think that usually most students will want to take 225. So you'll want to get through your data structures course. And then once you've done data structures, once you're basically in your sophomore year, you almost any professor would be thrilled to get to work with you. Awesome. Um, we have one more question before we end. Um, do you recommend, or I guess the next one seems more. Uh, it seems like with data visualization, there's a lot of blending between sensation and perception in psychology and data structure slash CS. Is that blend of fields a focus of your research and the CS department overall? So yes, I think that's an amazing question. And there is one of the things that Illinois does really well. And the reason that I think I'm here is the CS plus X programs. So I think literally half of all of the CS majors are some form of CS plus X, which means that you're studying not just computer science, but you're also studying your domain of expertise. So I teach CS 240 explicitly because that is kind of one of the most cross disciplinary courses because that's taken by all of the different CS plus X's. So um, one of the newest CS plus X is like CS plus music. So I've gone into like just nerd out with not just how do you, I represent data visually, but like this semester I'm looking at how do you represent data musically? So what is data sonification and how do you convey emotions with both music and making that music real? So I'm working with another professor, another professor in music, um, Steve Taylor, who has actually, so professor Taylor has actually taken data from the coronavirus genome and actually said, okay, if I were to make a musical piece that is the sound of coronavirus, what does coronavirus sound like by using the actual proteins? So it's really interesting to kind of think about how you can use CS knowledge, use data to apply it different fields. And I think that almost everything we do in computer science is cross-disciplinary. And I think the CS plus X majors are part of that reason is everyone you're meeting and everyone you're hanging around with are interested and in experts in some different thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't even know you could like do that, like take music and take the coronavirus like that. Like actually. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so we are kind of at time. So that is kind of all for our questions component. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. And of course, thank you so much, Professor Wade, for your time. Um, yeah, I thank you guys. It's, I hope to see you here on campus at Illinois and I hope to have you in one of my classes soon. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so